Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night here at Faith Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're watching. And uh, yes, you don't don't try to adjust your TV sets. It is me. Apparently, I think uh, pastor's tired of preaching. Even Doug's tired of preaching, so they called in the third string. So you've got me for this evening. But I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and I'm very, very thankful. I just want to put in a word for uh, Brother Ryan Cummins back here in our media team. Uh, Brother Ryan and I have been here through every service, everything that's gone on, almost just like things haven't changed at all for us. Uh, but it's been great to have him around. We've uh, very thankful as well that we put this technology in last year. I think it served us very well during this time. We have, uh, even though we have not been able to be together until this past Sunday, uh, it feels like we have been together. Uh, and so we're very thankful that we have this and we're thankful that you're here with us tonight. Tonight we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, and we're going to read uh, verses 49 and 50, the very end of the chapter. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Quite often, when a person has a, a certain physical problem, the doctor will put you on a low or a salt-free diet. And that is because studies have shown that eating too much salt is a significant high risk factor in causing high blood pressure. Jesus tells us that what is bad for us physically here is good for us spiritually. You see, as a Christian, we need a high intake of salt. Now, don't take that as a license to start pouring salt on everything that you eat. I'm not saying the actual consumption of salt is good for you. I'm talking about the lessons Jesus gave us about salt in the Bible. Mark chapter 9, if you read the chapter in its entirety, is a chapter full of, of very valuable lessons. It contains some of the most powerful and most practical lessons that Jesus ever gave. They were lessons that were given in privacy, but are meant to be lived out in public. In those lessons, uh, he used a variety of objects and subjects. He used a child. He used a cup, a millstone, even amputation. And in the last two verses here, we find he used the subject of salt. And that's a subject I'd like to consider today. In Scripture, in tradition, and even in historical literature, salt occupies a very prominent place. Now, in the Scripture, salt is referred to no less than 40 times. Salt was an ingredient used in the sacrifices. Jesus spoke of Christians as being the salt of the earth. In Matthew chapter 5, during the Sermon on the Mount, it's in the Scriptures and it's in tradition. Salt served as an expression of a covenant made between two people. Now, you might say, that's something new I've never heard. See, when Arabs made a covenant, they would put salt on the blade of a sword. And those who were involved would put a little bit of the salt in their mouth, indicating that they would be faithful and true to the covenant. In fact, in Arabic, the word for salt, compact, and treaty is the same word. God even talks about the covenant of salt in Numbers chapter 18. Now, it's quite in our lexicon as well. We have a lot of proverbs or idioms, if you will, that we say. One of the most common ones is, take that with a grain of salt, meaning that we should consider what has been said with some limitations. We use the phrase, so-and-so is not worth one's salt, implying that one is not worth the very food that they eat. The Romans had a saying, spill salt, spill sorrow. See, to the Romans, spilling salt was an unlucky omen. That actually is where we get that tradition of if you spill the salt, you throw some over your shoulder. In Mark chapter 9, here Jesus used salt to give us some very valuable lessons. The Jews had a maxim that they lived by, which was the world cannot survive without salt. Now, if we're to be the kind of Christian Jesus intends us to be, salt is needful. So let's take a look at what Jesus said about salt. 
and draw the lessons from it that Jesus wanted us to learn. First, he talked about the salt that is useful. Verse 49, Jesus said, For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Jesus here is describing how useful salt is in the life of a Christian. He described two useful virtues of salt. There was a salting with fire, and then there was a salting with salt itself. So that leaves me with a question. How is salt useful then in the life of a Christian? Well, first, there's the purification from contaminants. Jesus spoke here of being salted with fire. Now, there's, there's many different ideas about what Jesus meant here, uh, just as many different ideas about what he said as there are uses for salt. Fire is often used in the Scripture, and when it is, it's used to speak of sanctification or the, the purging. Jesus used salt and fire together to speak of a purification of the Christian's life from anything that would contaminate it. In January of 2009, there was a report put out by the FDA that a food plant in Georgia shipped out peanut butter that had been contaminated. It was contaminated by the mold growing on their walls and growing on their ceilings. And even though it was on the walls and on the ceilings, it infected that peanut butter to the point that 500 people across 43 different states were infected from it, and they have killed as many as eight people. You know, if we're not careful, we can let spiritual mold build up in our lives. That spiritual mold contaminates us. It leaves us with great consequences. If we neglect to confess sin, if we let our sin go unchecked, what, what we really have here is Jesus teaching us to salt our lives with fire, to purify our life from any contaminant that might pollute it. In Psalm 139, verse 23, uh, and I think 24, David expressed his desire that any contaminant and any impurity in his life would be exposed and purged. And we know these words well. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And even James wrote, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. See, when we salt ourselves with fire, there's a purifying of our hearts and lives from anything that contaminates it. You know, the mind can really play tricks on the human. We're human and we're flesh, and our mind can really be filled with a lot of things. It can be filled with dirty thoughts and evil thoughts. Our minds need to be salted with fire. And our hearts that are defiled by envy, jealousy, hatred, bitterness, need to be salted with fire. Dr. Ivor Powell, a pastor in, in Wales, told a story. He told about a man in his home church in Wales who was always praying, Lord, clean the cobwebs out of my soul. And he prayed this way all the time. One night, as usual, he said, Lord, clean the cobwebs out of my soul. Someone who was tired of hearing the prayer was overheard to say, Lord, kill the spider that's causing the cobweb. Is there a spider that creates cobwebs in your life? If there is, salt that spider with fire. We also have to notice that Jesus not only told us to salt our life with fire, but also to salt our life with salt. So there's not only the purification from contaminants, but there's also the preservation from corruption. Now, this statement, uh, most, most biblical scholars would agree that it's in reference to salt being used in the sacrifices. Leaven, or yeast, was forbidden in the sacrifices because it symbolized that which could defile. Salt was used because salt symbolized that which preserved. It, pre it, it uh, preserved it and kept things from corruption. There hasn't always been refrigeration. I know we take it for granted today. We can walk into the kitchen, open a refrigerator door. That was not the norm in biblical times. Salt was the norm for preservation. 
If you pack meat in salt, it would keep it from spoiling. Salt is a preservative from corruption. There is not only the need for our life to be salted with fire so that those contaminants are purged, but we also need to be salted with salt to keep us from corruption. We not only, as Christians, want to be clean before God, we should want to stay clean before him. The psalmist prayed, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sin and let them not have dominion over me. And in 119.11, the psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. The psalmist not only prayed for God to cleanse him of sin, there was some further wisdom that said he needed to keep him from sin. Salt is excellent at preserving for a couple of reasons, but one is because it's considered to be antibacterial. That's why it's good at preserving products. As an antibacterial, what it does is it inhibits the growth of bacteria. The bacteria feeds off the product, and that's what causes it to spoil. Bacteria have to have a wet environment to grow in, and salt prevents that watery environment from existing. And all this is good because salt's very good at dehydrating. It's very good at absorbing water from anything it comes into contact with. Upon contact with any sort of a bacterial presence, salt will begin to absorb the water through the cell walls and effectively kill the living organism. In the same way, salt in the life of a believer will prevent spiritual bacteria. You see, it's what keeps our lives from spiritual defilement. It will kill all of those organisms that are foreign to a godly life. Salt may be not the greatest thing for us physically, but it is very good for us spiritually. Spiritual salt is useful in that it has both a purifying and a preserving life, or preserving effect, excuse me, in our life. The first lesson that Jesus taught us about salt teaches us that we need to get right, we need to stay right, we need to come clean and keep clean. Secondly here, not only do we see the salt that is useful, but we also see the salt that is useless. Now we get to verse 50, Jesus said, salt is good, <clears throat> but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Now, as we've already seen, salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltness, it loses its effectiveness. It becomes useless. As we look at what Jesus says here about useless salt, I want to notice that he speaks of, first, the tasteless condition of salt. Now, in Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 50 here, Jesus spoke of salt losing its ability to season. And I like that word because the word season that Jesus used literally means to prepare. It carries the idea of adding flavor. What Jesus was speaking of is how salt can lose its ability to flavor. <clears throat> now, we don't really know how that works because in our world today, salt doesn't lose its taste. Now, if you've ever watched any documentaries on how they produce salt, you'll know that it goes through an amazing process where it is purged and purified and washed and dissolved, recrystallized so that we have the most purest forms of salt in our day to day. However, in Jesus' day, the Dead Sea was the primary source for salt. And the salt from the marshes and lagoons uh, and the, the area surrounding the Dead Sea the salt from that sea acquired a, a very stale sort of alkaline taste because there's a lot of gypsum and different things mixed into the water. One of the consequences of contaminants in our lives as a Christian is it creates in us what I'm going to call a tasteless testimony. Jesus said we are the salt of the earth. As Christians, our life is to attract people to Jesus not repel them. Let me say it this way. The life that we live is to leave a good taste in the mouth of the world around us, not a bad taste. The truth is that the tasteless lives of many professing Christians, 
I believe, has turned many people away from Christ. Mahatma Gandhi was uh, a Hindu, uh, a respected leader in, in modern history. Even though he was Hindu, he is well documented as being an admirer of Jesus and often quoted from Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. And when the missionary uh, Stanley Jones met with Gandhi, he asked him, he said, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear so adamantly to reject becoming his follower? And Gandhi looked right at him and said, no, 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 don't misunderstand. I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are unlike your Christ. I believe there's many people going to hell because of the people who are going to heaven. Christians who have lost their saltiness will not and cannot season the world around them. Rather, they lose their ability to attract because of that, that tasteless life that they live. There can be things in the life of a Christian that, uh, that leaves a foul taste, a behavior that's less than becoming to a Christian, whether it's at school or whether it's at work or in your neighborhood or even at home, can leave a bad taste in the mouth of those who aren't saved. There's the tasteless condition of the salt and then the worthless condition of salt. In Luke's account of what Jesus said uh, in Luke chapter 14, salt is good, but if salt has lost its favor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. Now in Matthew's account, this is his words, ye are the salt of the earth, but if salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden underfoot. Now, both accounts tell us that Jesus not only spoke of the tasteless condition of salt, but also a worthless condition. If salt has lost its seasoning quality, it's no longer a value to anyone. Having lost its value, what else do you do with the salt but throw it out? Spiritual contamination not only leaves us tasteless, but it also leaves us worthless. Hudson Taylor often prayed, Lord, give me wide usefulness. Now, the truth is, if our life is contaminated, God will not use us. It's often been said that God will not use a dirty vessel. Jesus said we're the, to be the salt of the earth. We're to make a change in the world we live. However, God will never use us to make a difference unless we are clean before him. You see, a saltless life is a worthless life. An old Puritan once said, Lord, I am only an old rag, but I have been soaking in thy word. Now take me up and squeeze me so that someone else can get a blessing. May God deliver us out of our tasteless and worthless lives. Lastly, here we notice in Jesus' words, not only salt that's useful, but that is useless, we also see salt that is used. In the latter part of Mark chapter 9, Jesus said here, have salt in yourselves. In other words, Jesus said, use salt in your life. We are to be salty Christians. And that's the title of our sermon this evening. And I don't mean that from the worldly perspective of being salty. I mean, we should have salt. We are to have a spiritual diet where we use plenty of salt. And, and all the lessons that you can learn from Mark chapter 9, Jesus was telling us a few things here. One, to use salt for its personal benefit. You see, when we use salt, it will cleanse our lives. It'll keep us clean. It'll cleanse our hearts and lives of anything that makes us tasteless in our walk and in our witness. It also keep us clean before God and clean the world around us. There's its personal benefits, and there's also its public benefits. It will not keep us from becoming tasteless, but also useless and worthless. It will make us be the salt of 
the earth as we're instructed to be. It will keep us effective in our walk. It'll keep us effective in our witness. Instead of turning people from Christ, it will enable us to bring people to Christ. When Thomas Jefferson addressed Congress concerning the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, one of his incentives was a mountain of salt. He said to Congress, one extraordinary fact relative to salt must not be omitted. There exists about 1,000 miles up the Missouri, and not far from that river, a salt mountain. This mountain is said to be 180 miles long, 45 in width, composed of solid rock salt without any trees or even shrubs upon it. He said salt springs are very numerous beneath the surface of this mountain, and they flow through the fissures and cavities of it. Now, some of you are saying, that doesn't sound like anything I've ever seen. Well, you're right, because Jefferson was obviously mistaken about this salt mountain. However, there's something practical there. Every Christian should build up a mountain of salt in their life. We should use salt in our life. Jesus taught us it's very healthy for us spiritually. The question is today, what do we desire to be? I hope and pray tonight that we desire to be a salty Christian for God. In this passage, I see those three things. I see that salt that's useful. Then I see that salt that's useless. But at the end, I see where when we take that salt and we use it for God, the tremendous things that can happen because of it. You know, we take salt for granted. We don't really think of it much. We use it every day, and we just kind of go on about our lives. But we need to understand the power that salt has, how to use it in our lives. And remember that if we're salty Christians, if we keep that in the forefront of our minds, our testimony and our witness to others will be so much greater than it is, and we can reach so many more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for tuning in. In a few moments, there will be a couple of numbers up on the screen if you need to reach out and contact us in any way. But uh, in that case, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we will look forward to seeing you again Sunday morning at one of our three services. There will be more information to follow uh, here, so stay tuned. You can get all the information about next week's services and the plans that are involved there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this church, Lord. We thank you for the fact that it has, has stood here, Lord, now for... For over 50 years, Lord, just uh, on this corner, in this community, working and preaching and, and reaching others, Lord, we thank you that, uh, Lord, you've given us that example of salt and how we can use it in our lives and how we can spread that salt, how we can use that salt to reach others. And Lord, that it's mostly important that we keep our lives as pure and as clean as possible so that when the world sees us, they see you in us. Lord, we just thank you for the promises of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for those who have watched this evening, Lord, and we pray that you keep them safe and pray that you keep all of our church safe, Lord, and uh, keep us safe till we see you once again Sunday morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless.